Number 12 in the books that I've read for The Great American Read is Dune by Frank Herbert in 1965. Now, the first thing I should say is that people reading this book now may find it hard to get past one particular thing, which is that it was the 60s and uh, it was unfortunately not a very enlightened time when it came to portrayals of homosexuality, and you had a few of the when it, they appeared at all, they were portrayed as like these depraved, degenerate things. And um, Dune is one of them with its main villain, Baron Harkonnen. And I don't blame anyone at all if they can't get past that, which is really a shame because if you can hold your nose and just kind of muscle past uh, the vomit instinct at that kind of thing, the rest of this book is pretty awesome. It's a very complicated story, but it's rewarding if you're willing to put in the effort to follow it, which doesn't take that much, honestly. But if you come in expecting it, like kind of uh, this simple good versus evil thing, uh, which the characters don't really have that much of a moral grayness to them, but there are a lot of them uh, working against each other at cross purposes a lot of the time. So that can get a lot more complicated than you'd think going in. And it, it does take some effort to keep everything straight, but if you do put in that effort, it's very rewarding because you have all these great plans bouncing off each other. And even in Baron Harkonnen, if he is this insulting portrayal of a homosexual, he's at least also smart to the point that you kind of root for him anyway, just because he's so good at what he does. And he comes up with these huge, intricate plans that all make perfect sense. And there's one point in particular where he loses a guy he had big plans for, and with barely any effort, he just switches over to someone else for that same thing, which is just the great thing about any memorable villain is that they're good at their job, and you are all that more invested in how they're going to be brought down by someone who can top them in their own schemes. So that's all a lot of fun and um, you also have this great hero who is technically uh, like a little bit too perfect uh, that's fixed in the sequels but in the first book um, people may find him a bit uh, like too much of the classical hero but uh, honestly I never really had much of a problem with it and the like if what moral ambiguity there is all involves his mother, who is part of this cult who's been trying to like basically do a breeding program to produce him and be their perfect hero. And he ends up uh, deciding that, you know, screw all that. I'm not going to follow your instructions just because uh, that you've been working toward it. And even if uh, your goals are sympathetic, the means by which you achieve them are crap, and I don't accept it. And it's really great to see uh, uh, someone willing to take a moral stand like that, especially back then, where uh, something like what uh, this ancient culture has been doing was viewed a lot more sympathetically. So that's one way it's ahead of its time, at least. And uh, I'm really trying to be vague here because a lot of the fun of this book is just the various plot twists and how these characters bounce off each other in different ways. And like you get attached to pretty much all of them. And so whenever you lose one, it does feel like a real loss. But at the same time, it adds real stakes to the story because you and even if you're not in much doubt about which side will ultimately prevail, who is actually going to be alive to see it is much more in question. And that is said, like a big thing that you're able to pull, if a writer is able to pull that off and make that real question of who is going to survive and who is going to get killed and then make you really invested in the outcome because it, you really can't tell uh, besides maybe a couple people who is ultimately going to see uh, the hero's triumph in the end. And on top of that, there's some very exciting uh, like intense uh, scenes of murder attempts and uh, fights and running from giant sandworms, which, yes, is the place where Beetlejuice got them from. 
And uh, those are all like uh, really well done, well written suspense scenes uh, of a kind that like you really don't see as much as you should. So when they pop up, it's important to acknowledge them. So there's some problematic stuff in here, definitely. But uh, for me, at least, the rest of it is so good that uh, I am able to like not really overlook it, but at least uh, just muscle past the gag reflex it, to appreciate the rest of it. Up next, the worst book on the list that I've read, at least, and uh, a very regrettable inclusion all around, uh, but uh, I'll have to get through it anyway with Fifty Shades of Grey.